Okay, I'd like to call the meeting order at 5, 5.02. I'd like to review the minutes from June 17th. Do we have a motion? Second? Anything? Everybody hear me? Move to approve, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. The meetings minutes were very good. And I got to do a roll call on this, guys. Bill? Yep. Yes. Judy? Judy. I saw you there. Judy? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I was mic'd. Uh, Missy? I know she's there. Missy, can you hear me? Going on the minutes. Yeah, sorry, I had to unmute. That's all right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Damien? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Phil? Yep. No, Phil. Oh, okay. Phil. Phil. There you go. Yeah. He's on yes. the island yes. somewhere. Yes. Okay. Keith? Yes. Mary? Yes. And Olivia? Yes. Thank you. Shelly, your next financial statement, please. Uh, there were 18 warrants reviewed by Mr. Halla, uh, totaling $1,861,098.03. Um, I did not send out any financial reports because we are still working on closing out uh, FY20 and getting things set up for FY21. Um, I imagine at our next meeting, I'll have some more details on where we landed for the end of the year. Um, but it felt premature to give that information now. Okay. And then when I signed the warrants last time, I went through them and everything looked good. That was my first time being the sole signer and going through them. And I was trying to be a, like a, a junior Mr. Decker. So <laughs> thanks, Bob. Yeah. Uh, but every, you know, everything looked good and stuff. So thank you. Shelley. Anyway, got any questions for Shelly? Doesn't look like it. Um, just want to just want to bring it up. If, if anybody else other than school committee members, if you can mute and shut off your video, that'd be great until public comment, and we'll let you know. We're gonna we're gonna go through a few things, and then we're gonna do public comment after we have a review of the school opening and stuff. So, and we'll do uh, um, public comment at that time if anybody's got questions, whether it's the. Um, the group or committee or uh, people who have chimed in with us. So, um, so with that in mind, we're going to do unfinished business and review the discussion of school opening plans. And I guess Darius, you're going to head that up again. Yep. I'm going to head that up again. For those of you guys who were on last night, I apologize. It's going to look a little similar. Um, I do have a guest, a guest here with us today who's going to help me tonight so that at least you have someone else speaking to you. So Sarah Mitchell is going to jump on and, and kind of spell out how things are a little bit different within the Frontiers plan. So um, I'm going to present again um, similar, similar uh, <clears throat> Do -do 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 -do. don't peek, don't peek. All right, let me shut these other little pop-ups here. All right, so our, our draft of our reopening plan, um, uh, basically the, and I, I hope I don't repeat myself as I go through it, but um, the, the state has asked us to come up with three plans and I need to submit them by the end of the month. The three plans must include one that has all students returning to the building. And if I can't have all students return to the building, I have to explain why. And what would it cost to bring all students back in the building following the guidelines of the state? Um, then the second model would be a uh, would be an all remote plan. Um, it's pretty self explanatory. That would be all students, um, you know, continuing what we did this spring. Um, but 
uh, we would be looking to improve that that model. And then the last um, model is a hybrid model of bringing in maybe a combination of both those those plans. So I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. Um, I just wanted to, we have this picture here. I think if, if people can look at that, we had um, a, a summer math program going on this week. And, you know, when we start talking about what does this look like, how can we bring back small, um, you know, in this particular case, about a dozen students, um, you know, learning outdoors, keeping space difference apart. Well, it's kind of, it, sometimes these picture brings out two different moods. One is like, oh, that's sad. But the other side is there was a lot of joy, uh, especially amongst teachers and some faculty members that were nearby to see students again. And I'm going to have... Um, you know, Sarah Mitchell can tell stories about this better, but I, you know, I heard that the students, you know, um, after the first day where there was a lot of discomfort, because um, it was kind of a new thing, were very, you know, happy to be there and, and good to be around um, other kids in some sort of normalcy setting. But I'm just kind of putting it out there because we are, it's, it's what's going on right now. So um, before I kind of roll in, I do want to thank all our, all the planning committees. You remember there was about 68 members on those committees, CPAC, um, you know, staff and families, um, we did send out the uh, draft. We've been taking feedback, and I'll repeat myself a hundred times during this presentation as I did last night. That feedback is valuable to us. We don't have a set plan. We're putting three plans together, um, and then you know we'll put more detail into a, probably a hybrid plan. Sarah's going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, but really, it is um, putting out these different plans, getting feedback from the community, and and moving forward there. I also have to mention that within each of these plans, parents um, or families that feel that they're not ready to send their children back if we have an in-school model do have the option to elect a um, remote plan alone. So if we do come back to it, they, if we were all to come back in, in its entirety and there was families that didn't want to do that, the state asked us to put together what would a, a remote option be so the students could still be enrolled in school, not homeschooling, but enrolled in a, um, much like we did this spring, some sort of plan like that. Um, you know, so but again, thank you to all those people that worked that and we want your feedback. So here's the timeline of decision-making. There was some early, you know, I said this last night, there was some early talk that the school committee tonight was going to be deciding that plan. That is not the case. Um, you know, we released the plan earlier this week. We did the committees and teachers on Mondays, the rest of the community on Tuesday. <clears throat> I had a uh, faculty meeting with Frontier today um, to hear their questions and concerns. We are, you know, clear the school committee now. We're going to talk a little bit later about when should this committee meet again, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit of detail later. Um, we have some town hall meetings. We're basically parent information meetings um, <clears throat> for each of the elementary schools <clears throat> in Frontier, and I'll, I'll flip to that next slide which has that date on it, and George will be inviting um, those Frontier families to, um, to that town hall meeting to talk about what the school could look like and ask questions and, and hear concerns and that kind of thing. Um, that's outside of our, you know, you know the, uh, the feedback form. Basically, the, the commissioners asked us to wait till August 1st to make a, for the school committee to make a decision on which direction it wants to go. Um, and, the, uh, and, and the reason beyond that for that is a couple reasons. One, we don't know where COVID is going to be. Um, you know, each week things things change and we want to be a little bit closer to our start date knowing where that is. There's also negotiations happening at the state level with the MTA and DESE and some of those decisions coming out of those negotiations could affect our plans. So we want to make sure that we have a, a more clear idea. Um, there is also a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say I'll call them gaps in our plan because there's certainly, there's just information we don't have. We don't have information on busing. We don't have information on and this is stuff that's being promised that's coming to us. Um, what do you do if you have a suspected case or a case of COVID in your building of a student or staff member and so on and so forth? They're supposed to give us pretty um, specific guidance on that. It was supposed to, I thought they said it was coming out this week when I was in the meeting with them last week, um, but it's kind of par for the course. When they say next week, they really mean the week after next week. Um, that's my humor there. I can't see people laughing. I'm sure you all are. Um, then DESE wants us to have the school committee's deadline is they want me to report to the state what is our plan by August 10th. Um, so here are the town hall meetings I was talking about um, in case you have children in me, perhaps the elementary schools as well as Frontier. But as you look, I went over that. No, you can't see it. Um, there we go. Um, is that Tuesday at 6 p.m.? Um, I'll see you then. If you can make it, we can 
ask, you can have more conversations about, you know, the school committee obviously is going to be looking for some information tonight and feedback, but, you know, if you have more, you know, more technical questions and that kind of stuff, it's going to be a great, a great time to have that form. Um, and you can see the other dates there as well. And so those invitations are going out by principal. So here's an orientation schedule. It's a cut and paste out of the plan, but basically um, what this is saying, and, and as we talk about more with our staff today, um, whatever we do going back to school, it's not going to be um, a sudden restart of, of school and everybody's being dropped off at the front door. There's gonna have to be um, orientations, even uh, this is pre-K through six. Um, I don't think we loaded the, I didn't load the middle school one, middle and high school one, but middle and high school, again, it's not a, it's, the plan hasn't been in place where it's, you know, it's needing approval yet, but we're, 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 we, we do believe that there's gonna have to be a slow re-entry. We learned that from the summer school program um, that it, you know, students need it. They need to be the social emotional um, adjustment period. If, again, this is if we go to an in-person plan or a hybrid plan of partial in-person, um, there's going to have to be an orientation. It may have to be several days of orientation where school is not looking like a normal um, normal time frame so that students can get adjusted, teachers can get adjusted. There's a lot of anxiety out there about what coming back to school looks like and what that feels like emotionally as a lot of people have been kind of sequestered themselves away. Um, and, you know, we're, we're considering all that. There's a lot of, when you read through that plan, a lot of talk about the social emotional well-being of students um, and, and faculty. Um, you know, through this plan. <clears throat> I talked about the three the three models. And Sarah, I think I've been talking too much. You, do you want to kind of jump in and just, my two questions, sure. sure, yeah. Um, so we have been planning for three models. We've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, and initially, when you do the math and you walk around Frontier and you measure classrooms and spaces and you account for um, six foot social distancing, and that was even before the state came out and said three foot, you know, technically you could fit all the students in the building. Um, and so we really took a hard look at that model um, to try to figure out um, who would teach what, how would we cover this. When you start really getting down into the weeds of it about how many students you'll have down at the middle school end, for example, where you've got um, 220 students, and then you look at class sizes during some of our blocks at the high school, and um, you quickly start to realize that you're short on space and you're short on people to cover those spaces, even if you're using, <clears throat> using your gym and using your cafeteria. Um, and so we moved, um, you know, just recently, and all of this, of course, is on speeded up time, because if we had all the time in the world, we would spend two years planning for a thorough in-person model and two years planning for a thorough hybrid model. But, you know, things have been shortened to days and weeks instead of years. Um, so we moved pretty rapidly into um, hybrid planning. You know, what, what would that look like for students? And how are we going to um, split up students into two cohorts? And so a couple of different things could happen there. Um, as Darius said, we're going to be offering families the option of remote learning. And we may have, we may have a, a, a enough families that decide to do that remote learning so that the students that um, want to be there in person could all come back in person and we would have um, enough space and enough staff to cover all of that. Um, the second hybrid scenario could be that um, many of our families want to come back in person and we actually have to split and make decisions about how to split up our students. So half of them are coming back on certain days and half of them are coming back on other days. Um, and we also are very cognizant of the childcare needs of our community, uh, the working family needs of our community, and um, our experiences with remote learning in the spring. So we're taking all of that into consideration. So none of this is being done willy nilly. Um, our number one concern always is gonna be the health and safety of our, our communities and our, our kids and our bills. Um, our third planning is the remote learning piece. Um, and we are spending a fair amount of time working with that also because we recognize that in a hybrid model, which we're starting to look at more seriously, um, we're gonna need a remote learning piece for that. 
And also, um, we do anticipate at some point we are going to be at full remote learning, whether that's initially at the start of the school year, whether that's a few weeks in, whether that's six weeks in. Um, but we've got to have a robust plan for that. Um, and that was one thing that we were really challenged with in the spring is we were switched over to remote learning over the course of a weekend. Um, and we were just figuring out how to build the plane as we were flying it. We <laughs> thoughtful this summer about the professional development that we offer to faculty. Um, we did adopt a new um, technology platform, Schoology. We just had our first intense training about that um, for that software yesterday. And we're planning on really um, building our content in there. Um, you know, our hope is that the situation in our area is safe enough so that we can bring all students back in person in some format, whether that's hybrid or in person um, full time, so that we can at least build some relationships and get some of that social emotional piece done. Um, as Maria said, it would need to be a slow transition. Um, I personally, um, this, su this summer, seeing kids in our building, the summer school program, um, it's, it just makes you realize how much kids need to be together and how much they need to see each other, even if it's in this very odd configuration. They were all so nervous on day one, and now at day four, they're they're fast friends. You know, they've managed to build those relationships with each other. Um, them are coming from the elementary school level, so they're incoming seventh, and we have some incoming uh, eighth students also. Um, and we did. We had students that were only signed up to come on, you know, a couple of days a week, and they were quickly calling, say, "Oh, is it possible if we add it? He's really having fun in the program." And you know, of course, we're able to do that. Um, so we just recognize, you know, how much kids need to be around each other. That's where we're at at the moment. Sure. <clears throat> um. And as I said, it, within our plan, the, the way that we can get feedback from families, um, you know, is that it was connected with the plan that I sent out. There was a, a, a link where you could submit that into a um, into a form that allows us to organize the thoughts very quickly um, on that feedback form. Um, we are doing more, going to be doing more family surveys. Um, there'll be one going out um, probably tomorrow morning. I think, you know, where we have the final touches on it right now, but it's going to be very, very precise about where you are right now and you're thinking at this time, you're not going to be held to it um, yet. Um, but we're just trying to get an idea of what are our, what are our numbers out there um, for families and, and how families are, are thinking, um, you know, through the actual numbers. We have those town hall meetings coming, coming up. We also have a special education strategic planning committee being put together. Um, and if Karen is on, I'm going to have her talk about that. Um, Karen, are you on? I am. <coughs> All right. You know what? Let me let me exit out of here because I, I think people like to see people's faces. And I, um, uh, how do I unstop sharing? Here I gotta go here. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I don't know how much I need to see my face. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Karen Ferrandino. For those of you uh, that I haven't met or haven't a chance to speak to, um, I am the director of special education here at Frontier. Um, and I've been here for 12 years uh, and always excited about the continuum of services and the collaborative efforts we here at, have here at Frontier. Um, three years ago, we came up with the idea of putting together a strategic planning for special education. And we presented at the end of that process, a one, a three and a five year plan. And so as we were moving forward with the uh, reopening plan that we're going over tonight, it started to become clear, two things became clear, is we had a meeting with what we call our special, what is called our Special Education Parent Advisory Council, CPAC. CPAC is an organization, an advisory council uh, in the district to give, bring information and to collaborate with administration and teachers, and also uh, to work together as a support group. And they asked to meet with us um, to kind of discuss uh, a request to be more actively involved. Um, in the decision making in the process. Simultaneously, exact same day, two hours later, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education put out their new guidance. It's a supplemental guidance to uh, the, the guidance that was put out for reopening. And it highlights, it highlights two things I think that I would like to share with you tonight. 
Uh, one of them is, um, as Sarah said, last time we opened for remote, we did it very quickly. We were building the plane as we were flying. And the department asked that we do two things, that we provide instruction, but also gave us the option to provide packets or collaboration with general education. The number one thing I want you to know here tonight is they've made it very clear when we reopen that there will be an obligation to implement IEPs. And to implement those IEPs based upon a model of service and instruction. That means no packets, no information being sent home to really implement those IEPs, whether it's done remotely or in a hybrid model or in person, there'll be a way to implement those IEPs. Uh, so that was one of the priorities that really came out of the guidance on uh, July 9th. The other, not to use the word priority too much, but the other thing that they came out with was really to look at our high priority students. Um, and whatever model that we use, they want us to look at being able to do in-person service to the extent possible, to the extent feasible. Okay. So that means really looking at her, they gave us a definition of high priority, a number of categories, and students would fit into two of those categories. They'd be considered a high priority student and once labeled a high priority student that the district really look at as much in person as possible, no matter what model we reopen with, okay? So those are your two priorities, implement, <laughs> a lot of priority, implementing IEPs and doing as much in person as possible for high, uh, high priority to students as defined in that supplemental guidance. So where does that bring us? It made me think, wow, whatever is decided, special education is going to be a hybrid model. And when you hear in person, they do make it clear that it doesn't necessarily have to be in the schools. It can be in other community uh, areas or in homes. So really broad in the way we are looking at special education and the various models we work with that special education. So we realized uh, what would be beneficial is to reconvene uh, special education strategic planning because I don't think this is going away. As much as we've developed the continuum of services, I think we constantly are going to have to look at, you know, remote, the use of remote technology, doing hybrid models and in person and using our community. So our strategic planning committee uh, will be uh, general education teachers, special education teachers, related service provider, and yes, parents. Uh, we want, really want to bring the community in to be part of this. We'll meet three times over the summer to supplement and add to the reopening plan. Uh, but I said last night is that doesn't change how much we're work we're doing as administrators and faculty and with parents outside of the strategic planning committee uh, to put together information for the reopening plan, but it's to pull together a committee that will really look at where we're at, um, figure out how ways to uh, provide training and professional development for the teachers as we look at these new models um, and add to the reopening plan and then continue our work all through next year to update and provide a strategic plan for special education um, as we move into the future. So we're adding that. I'm very excited about that strategic plan. We do have teachers already showing interest. We'll pull together the members of that. And it will be led by Sharon Jones, who's uh, a specialist in instruction and curric curriculum with the Collaborative for Educational Services. Uh, really recognizing to look at our strengths as a district, our areas of need, that having a facilitator uh, with knowledge and works without, with school systems throughout the state, that bringing her in would be very helpful. So she will be facilitating this process. That's my kind of overview of the strategic planning and where we are with special education. If you have any specific questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. It's a, very excited about the process. It's demanding and going to be time consuming, but as I say these days, uh, communication is key and all communication at this good communication at this point. So bringing together a number of pers uh, various perspectives uh, to come up with our strategic planning and special education is going to be key. So, thank you. So the, the last part of my presentation talks about we've already gotten some themes from the feedback that we've had and um, just kind of reading through them, the themes we read from the staff. Um, what are we going to do about, you know, high risk staff or staff that are uncomfortable about? Again, so I want to talk a little bit. I was talking with the staff today and we keep talking about the hybrid model in the back to school model. And people are like, well, is that what you're pushing? It sounds like you're pushing that. Well, Talking about the remote model, our meeting just, you know, I made the joke earlier, our meeting was over 10 minutes ago. 
You know what I mean? Because we kind of have an idea that we're going to improve upon that model. And maybe we can talk about those improvements, but really talking about a different way we're providing education um, in a hybrid setting or what does in-person look like? I'm going to be, my job is to keep pushing to what level can we do that? You know what I mean? So it, so many times I'll be talking, and I'm saying this to the, the public as well. I may be talking like that's the way we're going, but I'm just pushing it because that's the new, say new frontier, but that's kind of, the new, you know, that's the new direction that, you know, is different to us. And we have to really kind of vet through because there's a lot of issues about bringing students back. And so um, I just want to kind of clarify that. But so the staff is like, what are we going to do about high risk staff or staff that don't feel comfortable about returning? Um, screening procedures and, and, and safety trainings, you know, how we can get all that training in, in professional development for staff. Um, Concern about the air quality in our schools. I will say we're already on that. Um, we, we're bringing in our, our vendor to go through all the HVAC systems in all the buildings in all the schools to give us an update about where we are, how are the air flows coming in, what percentage are we getting in from outside air. Um, the majority of classrooms are set up for outside air, but not every classroom. So we got to make sure that you know we are getting that fresh air because I've, I've heard that concern from parents. Um, what about child care options for staff? Now it sounds like in a nutshell, you say, well, child care, why is that? Well, if they're if their kids are in a different district with a different model, you know, or we're doing part remote part here, or, you know, you, you kind of follow me, there's going to be childcare issues that they didn't have last year. And how can we be supportive? How can we, um, you know, you know, help it where we, in every way we can as employers in that area. Um, substitutes was another concern I said, you don't want to have different people coming in and out of the building when we were trying to create these cohorts of having the same people working with our with our kids, because it's you know it's talking about being able to control your population and be controlled. If there was ever an outbreak, you you don't have different people coming in and out. Um, and then you know their overall expectation for teachers. You know how does this you know if we do a hybrid model, you know you have remote teaching, you have in person teaching. How do you do a balance there so that we're not um, we're not having unrealistic expectation of teachers, but we're also working with them to have a successful model so that it's not you know they're not just chasing their tail trying to get every um, meet all ends. And what we've heard from families, and so I'm, I'm hoping people are, are thinking there are the questions for me here, um, but, um, you know, basically um, the hybrid models um, for working parents, you know, um, how does that work? If, you know, it, it, you could, we're going to continue some of that. Part of that is still the remote learning. And, you know, you know, the parents who had to step, step up and be teachers this spring, it was taxing. We you know it was very difficult on a lot of families or most families to become the teacher. And, you know, um, that may not be, you know, ideal. The, there's varying use of face masks, just like there is across the country. I've already heard it about parents who don't want their children wearing masks in school. And how are we going to address that um, it, within procedures and protocols with that? And the concern about people wearing masks all day. I'm stuck with my mask on for eight hours. That's not right. We're thinking of those things in our plan. We'll have mask breaks and that kind of stuff. Especially even in the elementary school as well, all the way through um, what we're, we're talking about. We talked about special education, I think a moment ago. Um, there was a, what about more information about this outdoor learning? Cause we said, we're gonna try to get the kids outdoors as much as possible. So parents ask for more information. What does that look like? Because, you know, we, if we can take our kids outside, especially September, October, there's no, if we can have a class outside, let's get those kids outside. They can get the masks on, just like you saw in the photo there. Those kids, you know, I think in that particular photo, show them all their masks on, but, they're doing activities where they're working separately where those masks come off. I think that picture shows them with them all on, but when you're over six feet outside, the masks come off. You can get some, sort of, some normalcy there. Um, clarification about homework guidelines. Um, it's a little bit more of an elementary, was an elementary kind of theme. I mean, we talked about doing less homework at the start off and really work on social emotional. Um, that might be a little different in middle and high school as you know, academics will pick up a little bit faster, I imagine. Um, you know, and then question about how are people going to be grouped in the, you know, you talk about the middle school, and then if you're bringing in part days, or you bring in part, you know, um, how are we going to break up those people? Um, and on top of all that, how are you going to provide and maintain a rigorous learning experience? Which is true. I, mean, I laugh, I make a little smile with that, but it's true. I mean, we also got to make sure we have our standards, and, uh, you know, especially, um, you know, across the board, I was going to say, especially in a higher level, but, you know, you got to, if you're teaching AP, whatever, you're teaching regular ninth grade English, you got to make sure there's a standard there. You've got to make sure that we're making our kids, um, you know, we're, we're educating them, you know, so, um, so moving forward, um, before we go into the question, school committee, the elementary school committee, so next week was, we were supposed to vote this plan. I don't know who came up with that idea. 
wasn't me. No, it was me. Um, it, it, that timeline was too tight. And then we had the commissioner say, um, you know, you really should be waiting to the beginning of August. And we're also realizing this is far more complex as it kind of rolls out, trying to get all the feedback. Um, the elementary school committee decided to have a meeting on the last week of July in another meeting in the first week of August. If that meeting in the first week of August to make a decision, but there wasn't enough meeting, enough information at this meeting where school committee, you know, you know school committee wanted to kind of check in in between now and a decision making meeting. Because um, so much, because we do need to hear back from parents, and I think school committee would 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 agree. That it's like you're missing. Where's the, where's your parent data on how they feel? And we haven't put that survey out because I couldn't put the survey out until I had a plan because. So we did some basic surveying early on where about 70% of families want to see some sort of back in, um, back in uh, building presence. 30% want to look at, we're more comfortable with remote, but we want to get a little bit more information from them, you know, um, to make decisions because things have changed. That was about a month ago when that survey went out and now we have a little bit clearer um, within our planning. People are like, you can see, you know, they're thinking about these concerns I had or, I have other concerns now, you know, this kind of thing. So um, like I said, we're gonna be uh, surveying parents um, tomorrow. Um, that survey will be open through into next week so they can get their information at these town halls and then fill out the survey afterwards if they're waiting for information. But we do need to snapshot in time about, you know, wh where are we right now about the amount of students who are gonna be choosing one thing, ch students choosing or parents, families choosing one thing or another to help us with our planning. So. Um, that's kind of where we are in a nutshell. So, you know, school committee is going to have to kind of map out its plans, but you guys can do that later. You can do that now. It's your meeting. Okay. Back to you. Yep. So why don't we start off with any school committee members, if they have any questions first about what Darius and, and Sarah and Karen uh, presented to us. If he, anybody has a question, come on, raise your hand. I have a question. Who's who's on? This is, sorry, this is Missy. Missy, how are you? I'm good. Uh, Go do you have any sort of sense of how much flexibility the dis the district has to make a decision different than what the state suggests? <sighs> Long drawn out sigh. So they've been they've been moving the bars a lot, and so. I'm really, you know, that was one of the things that was brought up at the super, you know, we've been meeting weekly with my buddy, Jeff, Jeff Riley, the commissioner of education. Um, and we were trying to get from like, how much is this really going to be in the hands or are you going to change what you're asking for? Because they, they basically, they came out, you know, they, they want to see students go back in the building because they, you know, the research says that in, in person learning is stronger than remote learning. Um, and the, the vulnerable populations are going to have, you know, far, far bigger gaps in their learning if we continue to remote that. Kind. So they're really pushing for that. And so I don't know if they're going to, I'm worried about that too. Are they going to come back out and say and change and move the goalposts as they say? And I don't know, everything's been moving. This has been the frustration we have. And I know it's got to be frustrating on your end where you see a plan that has so much wiggle room in it. You're like, what are we even voting on? And I can talk a little bit more about what, what, what we hope to have by, in August for you, and maybe I'll just transition to there. We hope to have in August um, a little bit more clarity about how we're improving our remote education. I mean, Sarah's got a good grasp of that in our um, in notes and in, 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 in so on and so forth, but we didn't have that fully outlined in the plan. We hope to have a, a, a more um, uh, exact what the hybrid looks like, you know, kind of take all the feedback we have and say, this is what we're putting forward as a hybrid plan. Like, this is when it, you know, this is when it's on, this is when it's off, this is where students will be. And, and have that and have that for maybe the, if we have a meeting in between, even have it for then. Because we're seeing even in discussions with faculty, um, discussions with unions and that kind of stuff that we better be looking at a hybrid plan because everybody coming back all at once in person is, doesn't seem realistic. And we're also looking within that plan that possibly we have to look at phases. Um, that's also being discussed at the statewide level um, the MTAs brought that forward uh, to, to Jesse as well. Um, we were actually talking about that at the same time. It wasn't just their idea, but the idea that you know, maybe we got to bring students back slowly and, you know, having check-ins, not just 
wellness check-ins of the how are we with COVID, but also how are we doing in that model? And then look at, can we bring more, more in and have more contact as time goes on? Um, we're looking at as well. So that's kind of the developments. This thing really is a live document and we really are from one week to another. And we're looking at what other districts are putting out there because everybody's kind of putting them out at the same time. We're like, oh, I like that. I don't like that. You know, and kind of um, borrowing from others and they're borrowing from us. So does that kind of, you see that kind of answer it? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, so for me, kind of part of what I think about is is just general flexibility, not just our ability to flex, but then as numbers change or as people travel out of state, their ability to flex in and out of uh, remote learning and hybrid learning or in-person learning, like how how much either do we oh, have control over that piece and from just a kind of toss all this out there and let you respond. The other piece that I think about from the medical perspective is that in my office, we are thinking about what do we do when flu season starts? So now we have kids going back to school. We've got flu season, allergies, and COVID all being this perfect storm. So what happens when we have a class of kids that start coughing and sneezing? Do we have a plan to kind of transition back out to remote and then back and I just, I, I'm, I'm curious about kind of how, how are we going to flex back and forth between these it potentially quickly? Excellent question. I, I, I believe the administration and even t in our conversation with teachers knows that we have to be ready to go remote at any time. You know what I mean? We may have a, there could be a spike at any time. So we're really looking for, you know, can we do some in-person model? And I think Sarah even alluded to, like, she even said, like, we're going to go remote again at some point. You know, um, she was being pessimistic. We want optimism here. But realistically, when you start talking about flu season, you talk about, they're talking about maybe a second wave. Um, we may be building all this for a month of in-person, um, some sort of in-person hybrid, then going remote again. But I have to emphasize on this. Um, and again, I know it sounds like I'm the in-person pusher, but that's my part of my role. Um, if teachers can make relationships and meet students in person to some level, that's going to improve any remote learning. In my in my opinion, my you know I guess I'm professional my professional opinion, you know that's that's and so if we can get eight weeks in before flu season or a second wave and and that and I think it was talked about today at this at the faculty meeting and have clear parameters of what means a wave is coming, like it's not like how I call a snow day. Like, ah, maybe, uh, you know, let me call three other people and see what they think. You know, it's really like, these are the numbers. These are the, we, we agreed upon them before the stove gets hot. When, you know, when, you know, how we're going to do this, how we're going to evaluate it. And I think that has to be part of the plan of any kind of return as well. Um, and so those are things that we, we believe the state's going to give us some guidance on that um, as part of, because they're supposed to give us guidance about it. But. I know I just saw Lynn shake her head sarcastically. I mean, but they they let us down so much so far. But I have to I'm trying to stay optimistic there. Um, the other point that you, you brought up, Missy, about the remote and in person, there is one thing that I think the school will have to do. You're not going to be able to go back and forth and do what you want. You're going to have to have like re-entry. You can't all of a sudden have a class of 13. Let's say we have a small hybrid, a class of 13 that's that's meeting. And then the next day it turns to 16 because three kids decided to come back to school. There's going to have to be enrollment dates that can come in and come out. It's also, um, if they're fully online learning, um, that looks different than in-person learning as well. And so the hybrids, there's got to be like, if you choose, you're uncertain. We certainly want to create a window to allow people back. When we're looking at the study that came out of Germany, they had a, a percentage of students that um, I forget, like 20% didn't come back. And, and after the first two weeks, they got 15% of that 20% of students coming back because they said, oh, it is working. It, there is that, you know, people felt more comfortable after they, you know, they saw it kind of working. So we have to create windows, but it's got to be something that's manageable, um, you know, for the faculty because they, they're going to be, you know, running around there. That's cut off kind of deal. So it is, it's in our planning as well. I got Thanks, you. Sorry to interrupt. I don't know. I have a question. Um, I don't know if Darius, you answer this or uh, if Shelly will chime in on this. Uh, you know, the budget that we passed, um, you know, a month ago or whatever, and all the towns passed, really, when, it, when the budget was written, it was written for kind of a normal school year. Um, with whatever model 
we go back to, there's going to be added costs to it. Cleaning supplies, masks that maybe are given out. I, you know, I know parents will be responsible for most of them. But, uh, you know, really this is a, a whole different world we live in that is affecting uh, budget. And we haven't even talked about transportation yet. So do we just plow ahead and whatever model we go into, it just – we just deal with the monetary function of that. And then, you know, next year we, it kind of gets brought up. I, 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 how does that work? I don't know, Shelly. How does it work? No. <laughs> <laughs> Shelly, you want to you jump in, Shelly, or I can try to answer? Yeah, go I mean, ahead. go ahead. Let, go let, let, have, let, let have other people. They want to hear different faces. They're okay. sick of mine. <clears throat> Um, so that's a really good question, Damien. Um, right now we are preparing to place some orders in the event that we would be back in school, um, knowing that even if we are in a hybrid model, we are still going to need some supplies, masks in case kids forget them, um, other PPE. We're outfitting um, offices so that they have the sneeze guards in place according to the state guidelines for office spaces. Um, and we're kind of taking a phased approach and trying not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but also being prepared that if we need additional classroom things, we're ready to order them. Um, you know, trying to be creative with, with some of the funding sources, um, looking at what we have for school choice funds in all of the schools, seeing what we have out there for grant opportunities from the state, paying attention to what else could potentially be coming from the state, and then also from the town, from the CARES Act. So. You know, we're being cautious, but want to also be prepared, not over ordering, not double ordering. But at the same time, you know, if there's a, a five to six week order time on some of these things, some of it we do have to jump on, even though we don't know necessarily if we need it yet. And just to, to jump on where, where Shelly left off there, this is the, the, the headache of not knowing until August what our plan is. You know what I mean? And, I understand, and you can't make the plan. You can't make the decision until August. You really can't because there's so many unknowns out there. But if we're buying, you know, plexiglass things to split lab tables or, you know, there's all these different kind of ideas out there of how to create safe spaces, but we don't know what model is. We don't know how much to order. We don't want to over order because the stuff's expensive, um, you know, and so on and so forth there. So it, it, it's a whole other thing. The, the one, there's a shred of good news is that Shelly said that the early numbers for PPEs that we had for all five districts when we made up the plan. Because you understand, it's not just masks, it's gloves, it's gowns, it's N95 masks for nurses. It's gowns for nurses for every time they're in, they believe they're in contact with COVID with a full, you know, it, it's full disposable for the next group person kind of deal. Like it's a medical office in some places. We're running a small, I, hate, I don't want to say we're running a small hospital, but in a way we have to be prepared at that level. Some of our special needs students require, you know, different level of shielding and masking and, and gloves and, and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot more, it's not just gloves, it's just it's not just masks for students, um, which someone would say that's not gonna cost much. Everybody's gonna bring their own. You just need to have one box on the front desk. There's a lot more involved there. Um, but the original number that came out from the five schools was over 150,000 just for PPEs. But that number came down drastically, Shelly, you told me today. Yeah, so the state uh, has some additional vendors that we can purchase from. So we're looking at probably uh, about only spending about a third of that between all of the schools. And that's only for a limited supply. So it's not going to get us through the year. But, you know, that's been one good thing that the state has done was to set us up with some vendors that are going to be sure to have the product and that are going to get us better pricing than what's out there on the Internet. So we're just trying to be really thorough in our research making sure that we're getting the best prices, that we're following procurement guidelines, and that we're, um, you know, going to be able to get the product that we need. And, you know, I'm really monitoring spending right now. There's not a whole lot of buying going on that's not going through my office directly. Um, and additionally to that, on a positive, maybe it's a positive thing, we are going to be asking families about what can you do to help um, you know, kind of a plea because this is a is an unheard of time. And you hear that for a lot from elementary schools, but we're going to be doing it at the uh, middle and secondary about like if we're going to try to create outdoor seating. You know, you know, can we get extra picnic tables? And does do people have pop up tents of any good size that they would be willing to donate for the fall season? You know, we don't want junk. We want you know you know stuff that you know we can take 
for the season and, and give back. So we're going to be, uh, we already have the, we have that letter crafted as well, but we're waiting to, to see where we are in the planning to really do a hard push about asking families to do that. If you're doing supply, this is more for elementary, but if you're ordering supplies, if you're getting supplies for your kids, you get a second one for the classroom or, or two for the classroom if you have the means, just so that, because you can't be sharing supplies like you used to. You're not passing the scissors. You know what I mean? You got to have, each kid's got to have their own set. And so, you know, we're going to be asking families to help out in that regards too. But sometimes the, I see it's a positive thing because it's about bringing community together about what's important. But, um, that that's coming as well. Um, that that uh, request as well. So, I think uh, Phil had a question next. Judy, did you have a question too? I do. Yeah, I'll go after Phil. It's fine. Phil, do you have a question? So, so to, to, to me, when when I th when I'm thinking about this stuff, Darius, the sort of the million dollar question is whether the state is going to permit the individual districts to come up with their own health or public health m metrics um, in order to 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 do to to open or to go to full or to whatever that you know if if the state announces that it's safe to do um, in person instruction, are the districts going to be able to? be free to say no thanks we don't think it is and uh, um, you know I, I get that, that that there's going to be a lot of individual discretion as to what each of those things would look like um, for each district but um, is the districts going to be able to make their own decision based on their own health metrics that they decide themselves I mean, you bring up you bring up a good question, Phil. I don't have the answer to it. It's it's a concern. I mean, it, it's my I, I won't you know kind of cry in front of everybody, but that's exactly how the administration feels. Like it, this is how it's been throughout. Like we we have to get ahead with planning, yet we may not be able to use any of the plans we put together. You know, the the, the countless hours of that went into those committee works, and that you know the you know Sarah and Kim who put the, the, the put the that plan together. Um, brought it all together and added the, the language around it. it. It was, you know, it was a tremendous amount of work. And now I don't, we, you know, you're right. To what level are we going to be able to implement? And are they going to take something back? I don't know. But without knowing, I still, we have to push forward and come up with what we think we're going to do. Um, the commissioner was clear. He is not changing time on learning hours yet, but it's on the table. I know it's on the table because it's on the table about professional development. And they're discussing that with the MTA. So they may reduce the number of hours required by the year. We talked a little bit about last week, uh, or maybe actually it was not last week, it was just Wednesday, it felt like a week ago. Um, he talked about, you know, busing. If you had to do multiple bus runs, maybe he'll, he'll ease up on some of the time on learning hours if you, have to, if you can't fit everybody in a single bus run. Well, bus runs are expensive, folks. And so we're going to have to kind of see, and we're going to we're gonna also have to ask parents, you know, if, you know, are you able to drive your child to school if we have any kind of remote, if we have any kind of in hybrid or in-person, any kind of in-person instruction? You know, because we're going to do the exact opposite we've been saying for years, like put your kids in the bus and save the world. Now we're going to say drive your kids individually if you can, um, that kind of thing. So we're going to have to really, we're going to have to look at that because we have to lower our ridership the bus. So I think it, I think the number is going to be 24 on a bus. Um, I think they're going to be like one per seat and then stagger the seating or that kind of thing. So um Anyway, so th th I think you, Phil, I gave you the answer. I gave you the honest answer, which isn't great. Judy, you got a question? Yeah, my question was about school choice. Is there any, you know, we voted to accept school choice, the plans and everything earlier in this season. And is there any um, consideration of not accepting as much school choice or has that ship already sailed? I'm not trying to keep people out. I'm just kind of curious if the door is still open. So we could reduce the amount at this point moving forward. In school choice, this was discussed at the superintendent level where this was a fear about we start coming out with plans and one district has a plan that looks better than another. Or and then you have people bailing on their districts to go find a plan that fits their needs. Um, and what, you know, the, at first we were concerned about the, you know, the, 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 the war of fighting over students, you know what I mean? And how do you, you know, who's going to have the prettier plan or, you know, that kind of thing. You Now you have the, you're, you bring up a good point about, you know, the influx of new students right now. I think we've accepted students at this point. The students that we already have, we definitely own. I know we can't disown them. Yeah. You know what I mean? We can't, you know what I mean? I don't think that's what you're asking, but I just want yeah. people to know legally, for, if you're a school choice parent watching, I don't want you to freak out like, oh my God, they're talking about that. School. No, we, if you are with us, you belong to us until the end. 
uh, meaning the graduation. So um, we could stop any new new uh, school choice. I think they've slowed down, and I, I think it's probably we should be cautious about who we're bringing in. I will say for remote teaching and it's school choice, that that's easy money in the sense of, <laughs> you know what I mean? This is you're adding one more, you know, it, it's not, <laughs> I'm joking, but I, you know, maybe, you know, I think, uh, you know, Sarah and, and, and George are both on. Let's add that to our discussion tomorrow, gang, and talk about whether or not we should free school choice. Because I really don't want people jumping ship. And maybe, oh, maybe we got to talk about the regional group of superintendents that we all agree that, you know, if you don't, if you haven't decided by now that we shouldn't have this big jumping of schools. But, uh, you know, that's kind of where it's at. I mean, yeah. you, you have to remember again, we're a winner in school choice. Um, no, I, I know. So not everybody wants to play that game. If they can ex get more school choice to help their budgets, they will. I'm sorry, I, I got a, for some reason, my Chromebook may die on me. So if you see me leave, I've been playing with the plugs here. So um, does anybody else in our in our committee have any questions? I have another question. Any thought to changing part of the school year and having maybe a designated remote option in the winter? I don't know, Sarah, did we talk about that at all? I don't think we talked about it that way. We talked about phases and maybe we'd have different phases based on whatever, but, you know, starting off whatever, and it's going to be hard. You'd have to have a, if you started off in person, you'd have to have a reason in my mind to stop going in person. You know what I mean? Because we just know it's not as, I believe it's not as, you know, the remote learning is not as strong as, you know, the accountability that you have people in, in person. So Sarah, do you have any thoughts? On, not to put you on the spot, but I just did. You have to unmute. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I said we've talked about everything. I'm not really sure there's an idea out there that we haven't considered, talked about, thrown against the wall to see it's, if it sticks or not. Um, and that was one of kind of our dream plans in the sense that the colleges are all talking about going back early and then stopping after Thanksgiving. That's a great plan. Um, I just think it's really hard with public education because, as Darius said, we'd have to have some kind of a reason to halt the bus and everyone gets off. But we're certainly planning on being able to switch to remote planning at seamlessly at some any point that we need to. Um, yeah, but I would love that. I'd love to have some schedule that said, okay, we'll do this and then we'll switch over here. Well, I guess part of a follow-up to that is that uh, – is there any thought to some sort of like alert that you need to notify the school if you have been out of the state where you may have been exposed to a higher COVID uh, exposure than, um, than everybody else in school if they haven't been out of the state? I mean, I believe, yes, we should have that in place because right now it says you need to quarantine for, for two weeks if you leave the state, right? And so I think we would have that if we have knowledge of that, we'd ask students to stay home and be remote. Um, you know, I think, and I think we talked about this a little bit about like in the idea that, you know, what if people send their kids to school sick, you know, that kind of thing. There's going to have to be really honest conversations with the community about there's got to be a level of, you know, we have to work as one unit. Um, and it's got, and it's a lot of people for that have that kind of trust. And I know some parents are, are wary about that, but you have to kind of put it out there. If your kid isn't well, you got to stay home. And, you know, and if you're, if you can't stay home with your kid because they're sick and they're sick, you know, you, you know, we're going to have to have these backup plans um, and ask parents to do that. It, I think one of the other things, and even as we talk about the elementary models as well, is that schools have been a place for um, child care, and we're talking about mostly middle school here, I guess, you know, not really as much in high school, but I've been in child care for, you know, the last 20 years. We provide not only during the school day, but we have extended care and that kind of stuff, and we can't provide it right now. We have to really kind of focus in on how can we provide education, and there is, and I understand, and I know it's going to upset parents, it's going to be an inconvenience to parents, um, and, you know, we didn't ask for this problem, but we're in this, you know, this is my line to people, that we didn't ask for this problem, we didn't create this problem, we didn't make a decision that caused this problem, you know, but we're, we have to solve it together. That's for sure. You know, so. Olivia, Olivia's got a question. I, actually, I Olivia, Olivia, I just want to quickly um, just add in about, and then you can ask your question because it, it just rebounds off of what Missy was saying about um, the 14 day quarantine. Um, I, I, I don't know if you leave the state, 
I, I don't know if each kid or a staff member leaves, but I do know like a family member myself, I leave the state every other week uh, and I'm exempt from that rule. Um, I'm considered an essential worker, <laughs> which I can chuckle at because I don't think I'm very essential, but um, yeah, I don't have to, for I don't have to quarantine myself for 14 days. Uh, that said, one could then argue with my family members, should they be quarantined for 14 days? I don't know. I, so I don't know how you incorporate and what, how you define who should be quarantining and who shouldn't be and if they leave the state. So uh, I, I just wanted to add that little tidbit about the, the 14 day self quarantine thing. Are, are, you wearing, are you wearing a mask, Damien? I just want to make sure we all want to know when you leave the state. I, mask right now. I'm, I'm home on my lazy board. All right. <laughs> uh, Olivia, Olivia, sorry, go ahead. Um, okay, I had just written it in the chat um, about the every other day models um, and the reality of that being enough time to actually get a really thorough cleaning in before another group of um, kids comes. Um, and didn't know if every other week was considered so that way, you know, cohort A would be there one week and then go home with a big project for the next week when cohort B comes, as opposed to what looked like every other day and then the cleaning happening at night and maybe not being done as thoroughly. Sarah, you want to jump on that? Because we've already kind of moved away from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we did talk about, um, that was one of our initial plans was the every other week model because we thought we could get some continuity of learning and we were really, um, pretty concerned about those cohort groups. Um, one concern that the faculty had is um, students, they get in and out of the habit of school pretty quickly. And so the fear was that they would start to sleep in on their week off and be less and less engaged in the schooling. And so we really wanted to try to get them in on a weekly basis. Um, but that said, one of the models that we're looking at is a Monday, Tuesday uh, cohort group, Wednesday remote for everyone, Thursday, Friday cohort, and that gives you that full day in between to do, you know, a deeper cleaning of the building. Um, that sounds wonderful. And it kind of segues into one question that I had, which was when I was looking and sometimes professional development was like on a Wednesday was when everything was off. And then sometimes it was a Friday on different models. And my concern with um, having it on the weekend is if people are only given 48 hours, they're not going to go too far. They're not going to be heading out of state too often or you know, going to visit friends. Um, but if we give them a three day weekend all the time, then it's more likely that people will be going um, places. And so I was just, you know, looking and seeing that a Wednesday might be great because nobody's going to go somewhere in 24 hours. But cleaning done. Yeah. And only to jump on, I think that, that, that last hybrid model Sarah's talked about is kind of our, is kind of rising to the top um, toward our thing. You'll, you'll, you'll probably see some sort of, as we flush this out, you're gonna see that you know, some, some, something within that model probably being presented, depending on when you guys wanna have your next meeting. <clears throat> Keith, you're next. Yeah, I just wanted to say, first of all, I got a new router so I can actually hear what everybody's saying fluidly. And uh, hopefully you can hear what I'm saying. I just wanted yeah, to hear yeah. kind of what Missy was saying. Uh, first of all, I, I want to uh, thank everybody. Uh, Darius George, Scott, Eric Kim, Karen, all the hard work. I've been involved in Amherst on the same committees. We're coming up with the same ideas, the three drafts. And these are drafts, just ideas. We're waiting for the uh, states to come out at the end of the month with guidance. We have to keep that in mind. But I just want to add on to Missy, like, just from my perspective, I think that we need to really think about fluidity between the three plans. I think we need to use them as much as possible. I would look at the hybrid model as um, if we do have to close. So I don't, I'm, I'm not looking at these three plans kind of exclusively, I think uh, mutually exclusive. I think that they can work together as well. And it's, you know, in a perfect model for me, I would bring everybody back in September is, you know, after almost like a, a two week period, um, if there were no sicknesses, we could, you know, where we are with low, low community infection, we can assume that everybody is safe. We can bring the kids back. And then in a perfect world for me, we would shut it down after, after Thanksgiving. You know, Sarah, you mentioned the college model. That'd be very difficult. And then phased reopening kind of in March after the flu season, it's, it would be really difficult. Um, but we have to balance that with, uh, 
the staff concerns, but I, my main point is just that there should be some fluidity. We need to remember some flu fluidity between the three models. Thanks, Keith. Does anybody else in our in our committee have any questions? I just typed that one, Bob. I'm happy to ask it though, if you want me to. Yeah, go ahead, Judy. Yeah. Well, my question was about um, just sort of extracurriculars, field trips, clubs, sports. I'm guessing all that stuff will sort of come out later once the learning plan is solidified. I mean, MIA probably does the sports thing, but other than that. Yeah. Um, you know, more specific um you know we put out the signups for fall sports you know just when i think i saw the email from carl um carl sear went out i think today or yesterday um you know basically saying we just got to know what your interests are because we got a plan for you know that kind of thing um i told carl um if we don't have athletics that we better be putting some kind of intramural mural thing together we got to do something to keep the kids active keep their bodies healthy healthy bodies healthy minds we have such high participation in athletics um, to do nothing after school would be a disservice that we can do something to, I mean, um, in a safe manner, um, that kind of thing. So the MIA is the one that's going to make the decision right now. I think the only decision they made is that things can't start until after school starts. I think I saw that email out there. Uh, if Carl is on, Carl, you're welcome to jump in. Um, but so we're gonna be looking at that. The, uh, extracurricular activities as well. I think the same kind of things, if we can get them going, you know, from drama to whatever, we can do that safely. Um, I agree. Let's do that. You know, t you know, the tech robotics club, can that, can that club, all those things that enrich our things, we should try to figure out how we do it again, see problem, fix problem. You know, mm -hmm. let's try to, let's try to figure out different, it may look different, um, but it might, you know, definitely get those things uh, engaged. Field trips, I don't know. Depends on where you're going. And I'm not sure that's happening. Get it? You know, we're, that's on hold right now. Okay. okay. But uh, maybe the field trip is, you know, walking down, you know, field trips to the, you know, bloody brook to do water samples and stuff is on, you know, but the outside of that is, uh, you know, I think it's probably off right now. Okay. Anything else, Judy? No, I'm done. Thanks, Bob. Anything else from the committee? I know there's some people out there in the public that may have a question. If you do, you could chime on and- Bob, can we do, Bob, can you do uh, just for or, some order in that because it can get chaotic real quick. Have them put their yep. name in the chat and then you'll call on their name in the chat and then they can unmute at that time. That way we also get their name for the record. It really helps out Donna. Yeah. <clears throat> Holly Johnson, you have a question for us? Hi, uh, not really a question. Um, I have three girls, one, one at Frontier, and I'm co-chair of the district CPAC. And I'm really just here to kind of introduce the CPAC. Not everyone is knows us very well yet. Um, and just kind of make a brief statement on their behalf. Um, Karen Ferrandino covered a lot of our concerns when she spoke earlier, and I'm really happy to hear that everyone seems to be talking more about the added complexity for special education students within all these models. I'm sure you realize that SPED students were left behind really with the remote learning, and we really don't want to repeat those inequities in the fall. Students with IEPs and 504 plans are diverse, and the best way to ensure their needs will be met is to include special education parents throughout the planning process and include CPAC representatives on the Special Education Strategic Planning Committee. Um, it is great to hear that that seems to be happening soon. Um, we do get questions a lot from parents with about the transition from elementary to middle school. And um, we really would, as a CPAC, would like to have more of a relationship with frontier staff and families so we um, are better informed about the special education process in the upper grades. Um, we plan on having a CPAC representative at all the town hall meetings, and we would like to encourage anyone with concerns to reach out to us at our email address. It's frsu38cpac at gmail.com, and I will type it in the comments. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Holly. Meg, um, I saw you wrote something in the chat. Do you want to talk at all as being a nurse leader? Hey, 
if you're still on. I am still on. Sorry, just finding the right button. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, no, I just, I appreciate the questions about um, quarantine and exclusion and return and just wanted to um, let the committee know that um, those are things that the nursing team are working on. We, um, right now, uh, we met actually earlier today to um, go over the, the protocols that we need to um, finish drafting. Um, we've done a lot of work on um, protocols just in how we're going to manage um, a child or a staff person who presents as symptomatic during the school day. Um, and we will be working really closely with the local boards of health and public health nurses um, because there are systems in place currently for managing infectious diseases, contagious diseases. And so, and those guidelines are going to be our go-to place. Um, so I'm happy to answer specific questions um, if people have them, or you can always email me. Um, my email is margaret.birch and uh, I'll put that in the chat. That's it. Thanks, Meg. Anybody else have anything they want to chime in? Hi, uh, Bob. Can I just chime in for a second? Okay, we don't time? have. My, this is Karen Ferrandino. Sure. Um, I because I tried, I tried to type in the chat and it sent before I could correct my mistake. So I want to orally correct my mistake. I tried to send this out to the CPAC to just let Holly um, and the co-chairs in the CPAC know that I will get the invitation for the special education strategic planning uh, to them no later than tomorrow. Um, and in the chat, it just lets them know that the first uh, meeting date will be July 31st, but I will be communicating directly with the CPAC no later than tomorrow morning, if not tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. If there's nobody else, um, we can go on with other unfinished business unless somebody else has anything else. Okay. Uh, meeting schedule, we need to vote on this. Darius, you wanna just chime? Looks like you're locked in, Darius. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. What do you want from me, Bob? Did you? Um, can anybody hear me? I have a problem. Yeah, I'm just. Hold on. Let me see. I'm trying to get rid of the. So let me take over for Bob. All right. I, I just did. Let me take over for Bob for a second. dying here. I just want to go to next thing, school committee meeting schedule. Oh. Can you, Bob, can I jump in? What? I'm going to jump in. Um, Bob, the, uh, I mean, school committee rather. So the elementary decided to have a meeting on the, tw on the, um, they decided to have a meeting on the 28th um, to kind of discuss Again, the agenda being we'll be only discussing the reopening plans um, as kind of a check-in prior to the first week of August. It, is this committee interested in doing a check-in meeting prior to the August date? I'm, I'm kind of asking it probably makes sense to do that, um, but it's your decision to do that. Um, and it doesn't have to be, I think next early next week is too quick. And so that's why I was looking for the last week in July. At least we can have something really kind of hammered out and we can really and try to get it out to you ahead of time so you can formulate questions about some of the more exact, especially if we're looking at a hybrid model with maybe and the idea of a phasing in and that kind of stuff. And so um, I, that's kind of where I was at in the sense of, uh, I think people are gonna wanna know what's the process here moving forward, unless you want me just to bring you something in August and you can vote on it, <laughs> but I don't think that's how you wanna do it. <clears throat> we lost Bob, who's the vice chair? Oh, it's probably written on here. It's Bill Smith. <laughs> Hello. Hello, I'm still uh, here. Where do you go? So what do you, you say, Bill? We just lost him. 
I think looking from, I think what you I, are. from what I can see from the chats, most people would like to have the check-in meeting, I think. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to have a check-in meeting on August on July 28th. Um, I second that. Don't do that because that's when the Union 38th meeting. I can't do it the same day. I just told you when they're meeting. <laughs> so maybe, maybe the you guys can maybe the the 29th is the following day or the 27th is the Monday. I'll, I'll, or you can even go to the 30th if you want. Amend my uh, motion. Make it uh, July 29th. Second that. A check-in meeting for the 29th. Yeah. Second. Motion is made right. and seconded. Any other discussion about the motion? Yeah, I got, I've got to call a roll here, but I don't know if I can get remember everything. You know what? I don't. You don't need a vote for a meeting. It's it's set by the chair. You guys agree to me? It doesn't have to be voted. Okay, cool. Meetings yeah, are meetings we have to called by the chair at any time. So as long as you're, you guys are all asking Bob for a meeting, he'll call a meeting. Um, and then maybe we could also set the the August meeting. Hi, Bob. Welcome back. Bill took over. He slid right into your seat without a problem. You're out, Hal. Sorry. <laughs> Um, you waitly guys can fight about it. The um, the the other meeting would be right now. The um, thirty eight is meeting on the fourth of July of August. Rather, do you guys want to do the fifth of August for that that next meeting, which again would be a Wednesday? So that way you can you can get your summer plans to make sure that you're like Phil on the beach with his phone. <laughs> So, so, Bob, in your absence, we decided to have a meeting on Wednesday, the 29th, Got it. and a meeting, I think we're looking for August 5th. Does that sound good to people? On Wednesday, again, both meetings starting at 5. Is 5 o'clock good? It keeps us from going too late, we hope. I'm not going to wood. All right. Well, we, got everybody, we got everybody with us, so we should, I mean, we could plan. It's a, you know, it's a. It's a few days away, and hopefully we can plan on it. All right, Bob, you're here. You take it back over. Okay. Oh, just in time. Next thing, um, uh, superintendent's evaluation. You skipped B. You, what did you mean to? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The school committee vote, that's for next year. That's a different thing, Bob. I was talking about just the process we were doing here in the summer. But I, I set out a, uh, I set out a uh, the, the committee schedule. And I don't believe this committee voted on. Did you guys vote on it last time to go with the, the schedule I sent out? So that was done by the joint meeting. Um, so basically, we did a a uh, the joint meeting. That, you know, the basically what we did last year. You guys can obviously set and change meetings at any time. That's your prerogative. But we like to set out a regular schedule so people can make their can plan their months well in advance and people can know when the next regularly scheduled meeting is. So um, basically it's following last year's schedule. And if we have to obviously add more or drop meetings, that's certainly up to you guys um, as you go through. So I guess we're looking to agree to the, the formal schedule moving forward in B. Sorry, I thought you guys did it when I was blanked out there, so. Sorry. Can we get a motion in a second? Motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bill. Second. Before we vote, before we vote, just real quick question: that that uh, schedule does that allow us to go back to in-person meetings, or are we sticking with the virtual stuff? You know, it's a good question. You know, someone made a comment last night about like you know the school committee's not meeting in person. How can you bring kids back? And I was kind of saying, well, it's kind of hard because you don't know what kind of public you're going to have. And so there's a part of me that says, you know, the virtual meetings uh, with that concern, you'd have to have it like in an auditorium because you don't know in the library if we, you know, if we had 30 people show up, it wouldn't it'd be, a, it'd be too crowded of a space. So um, I think you're keeping it virtual until we get a, a different, until we decide not to. And, you know, maybe things will get better and we decide not to. I don't know, That's it's, it's up to, I, I suppose it's up to you guys I don't know what the state guidance is right now, if they can go back to in-person meetings. I think they can, can't they? Um, well, Dar so. Darius, was, Darius made a good point last night, just to give you an idea. Tonight, we had roughly 35 people on at one time. Last night, we had over 114 people on 
listening to our meeting last night. So, yes, as our group of, of roughly 11 people plus administrators being at a meeting, but if if we have, you know, if we have 100 people show up then and we don't have a large enough space, then we're in violation. So, right. Or we could go to a hybrid model. <laughs> where, where, where we call me and everyone else could log in. <laughs> that's a good well, Actually, point. you could. You, that's actually not a bad idea. I was about to mute you, and that's not actually a bad idea. <laughs> right. Well, we can talk about that as we get closer to it. Right. Livy just said that's the way many places are doing, including my work. Okay, yep. Yeah. You know what, we could, we could set that up, but the one thing we would have to do, I think that would be fair to the committee is one, don't set that just yet. Maybe I can put that on the agenda coming up. But we, we, we would want to vote to have the ability, we never really decided to do this, but um, the ability for members to come in remotely if they are unable to attend. Because one of the things that we're not considering, and, and nobody wants to be the person that raised their hand to say that, but if any, if any school committee member had a pre-existing condition that precludes them from being in crowds of you know people and that kind of stuff, you want to make sure that you have that option, or if your life circumstances change to a, a reason where you can't attend the meeting, that you have the ability to still serve in your position. So I would suggest that we, we put it on the agenda um, in the future, and I, also that we vote that members can remote um, in. And there's a rule that you have to follow that, that. I think it might be lax right now, but there's some ruling on that as well. So and maybe we, you know, we can we can discuss that at that meeting. I really like that idea with the uh, type of job that I do because there are meetings obviously that I miss. And if I could be in a hotel room and log in, that would be, that would be great. Or a bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't do that. Oh, okay. So are we going to vote? Are we going to, we have a uh, motion in a second. Are we going to vote on this? Yeah, go ahead and set the schedule so we can we can post that so we know when people can put in their calendars and such and then we can adjust it we can adjust how it works later and times so we have a motion in a second i'm gonna do a roll call okay bill yep judy yep missy yep uh damien yes lynn Yes. Mr. Yep. Cancer. From well, the beach, I vote yes. Okay. Are, do you have a striper on or what? <laughs> Keith? Uh, can you just clarify what I'm voting on? <laughs> no striper. striper. <laughs> School committee meeting schedule. Okay, yes. Mary? Yes. Olivia. Yes. Thank you. So next we have next we have the superintendent's evaluation. And we had 17 responses out of all school, school committee members. So this is a joint um, information I'm going to be giving you on percentages and stuff of all the school committee members, not just Frontier. So the first one was, first one was instruction, instructional leadership indicators. So 58.8% said Darius was proficient. 41.2% was, I had a tough time with this world. I'm just going to say he got the top mark on it. Explain. Ex, ex, I'm not going to try it again. I had a tough time last night doing this, but uh, that, that's two of the highest percentages were up on the top. No one, no one said needs improvement or unsatisfactory, or no one gave gave them no ratings. On the second one, management and operation indicators, it was exactly the same: forty-seven point one percent and forty-seven point one percent on 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 the top. My wife is trying to tell me what Exemplary. to say. Oh, thank you, honey. <laughs> and then there was there must have been one person that had no rating on it. On standard three, family community engagement indicator, 58.8% on proficient, 35.3% on the top, and look like maybe one person on needs improvement. 
on on standard four professional cultural indicator, 70.6% on proficient and 29.4% on the top. There's other comments. I'm not going to read through the comments. If you if you want to read the comments, I think uh, Donna posted, if Donna's there, I think Bonna posted it through an email. Correct me if I'm wrong, Donna. She did. Yep. Thank you. Any any questions? I don't know to me or or you want to say to Darius or I see Phil chiming in. It must be Phil wants to say something. No. Does anybody have any questions about the evaluation? If not, and we're going to go right down to new business on um, open letter to teach in race and race, racism. Darius? I think you have to, you have to vote the, uh, do you have to vote the evaluation, Bob? It doesn't except say vote the after except it, the evaluation. It doesn't say vote after it, so. All right. Donna, do we have, to, have vote to vote on it? The, you should vote to accept it. We did that last night. Okay. Okay. Sorry, we maybe we didn't put I it on the agenda. My bad. <clears throat> oh, sorry, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bill. Second. Judy, a second. Judy, a second. You, Judy? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll do a roll call again, Bill. Yes. Judy. Yep. Missy. Yes. Damien. Yes. Hi. Phil? Whoop. Hello, Phil. From the islands. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Keith? Yes. Yes. Mary? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. And Olivia? Yes. Thank you. On to new business now, Mr. Mr. Superintendent. <laughs> yep. You know, just first of all, I just want to thank everybody for the evaluation. And as I said last night, um, you know, as, and I know this committee doesn't wait to the evaluation to give me feedback, but please give me feedback as we go through, because obviously you improve my job. I need to know from you guys um, ongoing about, you know, you know, what needs, what the needs have to be, what I need to be doing and what I need to correct. So I appreciate that, that we kind of, yeah, I think we mutually agree that's an ongoing process and we don't just kind of save it up for the end of the year. So, but, so I appreciate that moving forward and, um, and thank you. Um, so, you know, basically the, uh, I just want to talk about as you guys all received the letter um, from our alumni regarding um, the open letter on teaching race and racism. Um, and I, you know, I, I just I wanted to put on the agenda today because I thought it was important. I, I really appreciated our alumni putting this letter together and uh, um, not only putting together a well-written letter, um, but really putting in some actionable steps for us to consider. I think the administration really took it to heart. Um, you know, as you know, we started our uh, Committee on Racism and Equity group. I think they met last week. And, you know, and Scott Dredge, are you on? You know, Scott really is one of the people behind um, the work that started here at Frontier and in getting this group going. Scott, are you available to talk around this? Sure thing. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was great to, uh, receive that letter a couple weeks ago. I know we all received the same letter and, um, when Mario sent that, uh, to us along with that massive list of alumni, um, I wrote back and asked to be added to that list as an alumni. Um, and I took that opportunity, um, to let her know that I think a lot of those considerations that they put in that letter were, were aligned with the direction we were, we were heading. Um, and so I took that opportunity too to let their, let, let them all know, um, about the work we were beginning with the, um, district wide anti-racism and equality, uh, committee. And, uh, so I gave, gave her an email to pass along an update on that. And, and just so you all know, uh, we, we are going to provide an update for you now where we are at. We did meet. Uh, on July 7th, I believe it was, or 6th, the Monday the 6th. And um, it was really more of just a meet and greet 
uh, so be, everyone could get to know each other. It was a pretty massive group. Um, it, it, we're in the 40s now, I believe. And uh, the co-chairs of that group are Jamie Isler, who many of you know as a former uh, school committee member, and um, Kelsey Kropp is one of our guidance counselors. They're going to lead us uh, forward. Um, I'm just going to take a backseat to things. Um, sort of, I'll be behind the scenes, um, help helping you know with logistics and pulling things together at that administrative level. Um, our next meeting is this Monday, the 20th, and the purpose of that that meeting is we're going to be forming subcommittees in the four areas of professional development, curriculum, school policy, and school culture. And these subcommittees will then be tasked with uh, researching those respective areas and then reporting back. Um, our goal is to really hit the ground running when the school year starts and we have access to the kids again um, because the kids, you know, make up a fair chunk of this group. Um, uh, we also want to have things in place to be able to um, report to the faculty, um, make recommendations to school committees. Um, about what to add in and make purposeful decisions moving forward so we don't lose sight of this, this uh, movement. I think that's it. Thanks, Scott. Does well, anybody have any questions for Scott? Yes, Keith. Keith? I just want to compliment Scott and, and Darius for taking this work head on, um, engaging it, and um, really compliment uh, the former students and alumni for coming out as well. Agree. I want to thank uh, Muriel Fallon Brown, Brown, Brown Fallon, I should say. And uh, I know her personally, and it was, it was nice that she uh, composed a letter and got all the alumni to, to sign it and stuff. And that hopefully everybody got a list of who signed it. There's 200 and I don't know, 280 or so. And um, I was very impressed. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't have anything. Do we have anything from the collaborative land that you could share with us? Uh, yeah. Hold on. Um, I guess the big news is that um, the executive director, Bill Deal, is going to be retiring in November, I think. So uh, the last meeting was really about setting up a committee to start looking for a new executive director. That's the big news. That's it. Good. Uh, George, I know you're around. Do you have anything to share with us? I, I, think, I think it's already been said, Bob. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I I wanted to give your your little chime to come in if you needed to. I appreciate it. You know what, George? Um, it, George, to, to put you on the spot, can you give give an update on graduation because we did move that into the first week of August here, and you just kind of let people know where that stands. So, all right. So currently, with graduation, uh, it's still obviously happening uh, August eighth uh, at nine a.m. Uh, we're going to be having a committee. Uh, we're going to probably be having our next meeting about it, uh, I would say the last week of July. But what we're currently looking at doing is um, is having, um, and, and this is something we have to finalize, uh, basically uh, looking to have immediate family only uh, up to a maximum of four, four individuals uh, from that family able to come. Um, uh, beyond that, the students picked up their, their caps and their gowns uh, last night. They picked up their yearbooks. Um, and from what I was told, Scott told me that it was, it went, uh, it went swimmingly. So that's currently where we are with graduation. We're going to be sending out updates, um, through power school to the families of the, uh, the graduating seniors. And, uh, we look forward to, to, uh, to, uh, 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 an exciting event. So just let people know that I'm working with Carolyn Ness as well, because we have to have this approved by the board of health to have a, a gathering of this this size. And so I have to make sure that we get the approval to do this. So we're talking about that. Um, I'm showing her some other Western Mass schools that are larger than us that are doing something similar. So I'm hoping that we can get that through, but um, it may be on our topic at our next meeting if we're having issues. So, um, but I hope that I don't, I don't see any problems. Yeah. I know, I know my niece, my great niece up in Portsmouth graduated this year and two people were allowed to come to the graduation. They had 200 and something people on the football field with six foot distance between the chairs and stuff. So 
they did it with only, like I said, two family members, mother and father in most cases. So, Yeah, and that's Seriously? what we're looking at right now, Bob. We're looking at whether or not we're going to be doing two or four. That's, that's, that's our next discussion. Because we're a smaller, okay. we have a small graduating class, I think that there's about 88 kids, and there may be even fewer kids who would be able to attend the graduation. We're, we're trying to sort of decide what, the, what, what a decent threshold is. Is it two or is it four? Okay. Thanks. Dear you see anything else you want to add into anything else tonight before we adjourn? Do we have no, to go? We don't have to go to the executive session for anything, correct? No, we're good. Okay. Does anybody have any parting words? Move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. Second. So we're going to do a roll call. We have to. Bill? Yes. Judy? Yep. Missy? Yes. Damien? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bill? Yes. All right. Uh, Keith? Yes. Mary? Yes. Olivia? Yes. And yes for myself. Good night, everybody. Good night, Bob. Good night, everyone. See you.